On October 20, 1993, a woman working the tip lines for the popular show America's Most Wanted receives a call from a tearful young woman. They had just aired a segment about two unidentified murder victims, both young women in their late teens or early 20s, whose cases had gone cold. The fifth victim was found off a rural road in Placer County, California in 1985. She had been burned almost beyond recognition and had duct tape covering her mouth and around her wrists. In her back was a long gash as though made from a knife. A few of her belongings as well as several diapers were found around her remains, leading police to worry that she had an infant who was now missing and possibly in danger. An autopsy would reveal that she had been alive when she was set on fire, but police couldn't identify her and she didn't match anyone who had been reported missing. Due to the state of the remains, a positive identification was never made and Susan was classified as Jane Doe, number 4873-84. The second victim, found a year later, had been hogtied, stuffed into a large popcorn cup box and discarded in Martis Creek Lake, near Truckee, California. Her remains had been too decomposed to identify or determine her cause of death. She was discovered a few hours after she had been disposed of. The only identifying features that they could find on her remains were her chipped front teeth. She could not be positively identified, so the police classified her as Jane Doe number 6607-85. The woman on the other end of the tip line tells the operator her name is Terry Knorr. She has an incredible story of cruelty to tell, one that is so horrific that for years no one believed her. The two murdered women she tells the operator are her older sisters, Susan and Sheila. The murderer, she says, was her mother, Teresa Knorr. Terry ran away from home when she was 15. Living on the streets battling with mental health issues and addiction, she frequently found herself on the wrong side of the law. Every time she was arrested, she would tell the police about the horror movie that had been her life growing up. Her mother, she tried to tell them, was a monster who had tortured her children and killed two of them. But no one, not even her therapist, would believe her. Until she was put in touch with Placer County Sheriff's Department, who recognized that many of the details Terry told them fit with their unsolved Jane Doe. At the Nevada County Sheriff's Department, they recognized the story as well. Finally, someone believed her. Teresa Cross had always been a manipulative, controlling person. When she was 16, she dropped out of high school to marry Clifford Sanders. While they were married, she gave birth to her first child, Howard. She was described as jealous and controlling of Clifford, constantly accusing him of cheating on her. They fought often, and Clifford punched her on at least one occasion. She called the police, and when it came through with the arrest, she dropped the charges. Then on July 6, 1964, they argued again. Clifford announced he was leaving Teresa, who was pregnant with Sheila. She shot him in the back with a 30-30 rifle as he's walking out the door. Slug lodged in his heart, killing him. Teresa pled not guilty, claiming self-defense. It worked. She was acquitted. Now a single mother of two, Teresa began drinking more frequently. She also began a string of relationships, one of which was to a Marine named Robert Knorr, with whom she had four more children, Susan, Robert, William, and Terry. Robert adopted Howard and Sheila, who changed her last name to Knorr as well. Once again, Teresa's heavy drinking, jealousy, and constant accusations of infidelity drove her husband away. He left in 1969 and they divorced in 1970. Robert wanted to remain in contact with his children, but Teresa refused. She married twice more and both of those marriages fell apart due to her drinking and jealousy. After her last divorce, her mental and physical health began to deteriorate. She gained weight and began having paranoid delusions. She took the children out of school, cut off the phone service to their home, and wouldn't let the children go outside. Always controlling, Teresa began to become more violent and unpredictable. She accused her children of things that they had not done, and she would beat them for their imaginary actions. Her children described the weapon she would beat them with as the Board of Education, a three-foot-long board that was about one and a half inches thick, with an electrical tape wrapped around one end to form a handle. Teresa would make the other children hold her siblings down while she beat them. Her abuse didn't stop with beatings, though. She would burn her children with cigarettes, force them to do grueling labor in the heat, deprive them of sleep, and throw knives at them as a game. She once locked Terry in a chest freezer for the supposed crime of telling other people that Teresa didn't take care of her children. But the worst of her anger and abuse was directed towards her daughters. In an interview, Terry said her mother resented that Susan and Sheila were maturing and blossoming into attractive young women while she faced the prospect of losing her looks as she aged. At one point, she became convinced that Susan was a witch who had cast a spell on her, causing her to gain weight. So in addition to beating her, Teresa began to force feed Susan to make her gain weight. Teresa would make huge pots of macaroni and cheese, adding in hunks of lard, and force Susan to eat it all. If Susan got too full to eat any more, Teresa would force spoonfuls of the food into her mouth. If Susan vomited, Teresa would make her eat that too. Sources differ on what happened next, but some say Susan ran away, others say she was arrested while walking on the street. The important thing is that she was finally able to tell the authorities about her mother's abuse. Teresa of course denied it. Caseworkers questioned the other children, but with their mother in the room with them, they were terrified and the children backed up their mother and denied she ever hit them. Satisfied, DHS closed the case and returned Susan to her mother's custody. Whatever hell Susan had suffered before was nothing compared to what she would endure after that. Nor refused to let Susan leave the house and force her to drop out of school. Nor also pulled their other children out of school, and most of them never advanced past the eighth grade. Teresa handcuffed Susan under the dining room table and gagged her. 
Teresa continued to beat her and force feed her. She even enlisted her sons, Robert and William, to participate in the beating of Susan. This went on for about two years. Accounts differ as to what happened next, but Robert claims that Teresa gave Terry, who was a young child, a pistol and told her to hold it on Susan while Teresa went into the other room. Something startled Terry and a gun went off, shooting Susan in the abdomen. Terry says that her mother became angry and shot Susan in the chest with a 22 caliber pistol. The bullet became lodged in her back, but Norm refused to allow Susan to seek medical attention. Either way, Susan was in grave condition. Rather than call an ambulance, Teresa had the boys carry their sister into the bathroom and put her in the tub. There, Teresa handcuffed her to a soap dish and left her for dead. Miraculously, Susan survived for a week in great pain, so Norm began to nurse her back to health and allowed her other daughters to aid Susan as well. Susan eventually recovered without receiving professional medical treatment. In July 1984, Nora and Susan got into an argument, during which Nora stabbed her daughter in the back with a pair of scissors while she was still handcuffed in the tub. Nora again refused to allow Susan medical treatment. She begged her mother to just let her go, promising she wouldn't tell anyone what happened. This went on for quite a while, until Teresa eventually relented. Nora agreed to let her go under the condition that Susan allow her to remove the bullet from her back so it could not be used as evidence in the event that Susan reported the abuse. Susan reluctantly agreed. Nora gave Susan Melaril capsules and liquor as an anesthetic, which caused Susan to pass out. While Susan was unconscious, Nora ordered her 15-year-old son Robert to remove the bullet with an X-Acto knife. Susan awoke the following day in immense pain. After the surgery was complete, Teresa flushed a bullet down the toilet. But Susan never recovered. She was in horrific pain. Teresa gave her ibuprofen and antibiotics. Susan became delusional from the infection and pain and soon slipped into a coma. Teresa insisted Susan was just faking it and left her on the kitchen floor, instructing her other children just to step over her unconscious body. As Susan lost control of her bladder, Teresa put diapers on her. As Susan's body turned yellow from sepsis and jaundice, Teresa claimed it was proof that Susan was possessed by a demon. And the only way to exercise the demon, she believed, was with fire. On July 16, 1984, Nor packed all of Susan's belongings into trash bags, and after binding Susan's arms and legs and placing duct tape over her mouth, ordered her sons Robert and William to put Susan in the car. They drove her to Squaw Valley where Robert and William placed her on the side of the road on top of the bags containing her belongings. Teresa and Nora then doused Susan in the bags in gasoline and lit the girl on fire. Susan's still smoldering body was found the following day. An autopsy determined that she was still alive when she was lit on fire. Due to the state of the remains, a positive identification was never made and Susan was classified as Jane Doe number 4873-84. With Susan gone, Teresa's fury now focused on Sheila. Like she had with Susan, Teresa began to force feed her. Once she shoved the spoon into Sheila's mouth so hard, it tripped her two front teeth. In May 1985, Nora forced Sheila into prostitution to support the family. Nora was initially pleased with this arrangement due to the large amounts of money Sheila was earning and allowed Sheila to leave the house whenever she pleased. After a few weeks, Nora became angry and accused Sheila of being pregnant and contracting a sexual transmitted disease, which Nora claimed she caught from Sheila via a toilet seat. Sheila initially denied the accusations. She beat Sheila and handcuffed her under the table as she had with Susan. Sheila was forbidden to use the toilet or even the bathtub. Teresa continued to beat Sheila, demanding she confess to giving her mother venereal disease. When that didn't work, Teresa hogtied her daughter and shoved her into the broom closet with no ventilation. She left her there for weeks, without food or water. When Sheila would scream and plead to be let out, Teresa would simply turn up the TV to drown her out. To end the punishment, Sheila confessed to being pregnant and having the STD, but Nora still would not let her out of the closet claiming that Sheila was lying. Sheila became delusional, talking about climbing up towards the light. Sheila died three days later on June 21, 1985 of dehydration and starvation. The last thing any of them heard from the closet was a loud thump. Nora left Sheila's body in the closet for an additional three days before discovering that Sheila was dead. When Teresa finally opened the closet door, Sheila's composing body fell out. Once again, Nora ordered her sons William and Robert to dispose of Sheila's body, which had begun to decompose causing an odorous smell that filled the apartment. The boys placed Sheila's body in a cardboard box, which they then disposed of near the airport in Truckee, California. Sheila's body was discovered a few hours after it had been disposed of, but was never positively identified and was classified as Jane Doe number 6607-85. Even though Sheila's body had been removed from the closet, the smell of decomposition still lingered in the apartment. Nor became concerned that the smell and physical evidence in the closet would implicate her in Sheila's death. On September 29, 1986, Nor moved the family's belongings out of the home and ordered her youngest daughter, Terry, to burn down the apartment in an effort to destroy any physical evidence. During the night, Terry Nord dumped three containers of lighter fluid on the apartment floor and set it on fire. The fire did little damage as neighbors quickly reported a fire before it spread. The closet in which Sheila died was not damaged. After Nord's arrest, investigators were later able to remove the subfloor from the closet to test it for physical evidence. 
After leaving the Sacramento apartment, Nor went into hiding. Her surviving children, who were by then legal age, severed their ties with their mother. Nor's youngest child, 16-year-old Terry, also left her mother's care and used Sheila's identification card to pass herself off as a legal adult. The only child to remain with Nor was Robert Jr., who was then 19 years old. Nor and Robert Jr. moved to Las Vegas and attempted to keep a low profile. In November 1991, Robert Nor Jr. was arrested after he fatally shot a bartender in Las Vegas bar during an attempted robbery. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Shortly after Robert Jr.'s arrest, Nor left Las Vegas and relocated to Salt Lake City. After escaping from her mother, Terry Nor attempted to report her sister's murders to the Utah police, but they dismissed her stories as fiction, as did a therapist she visited. On October 28, 1993, Terry Nor contacted America's Most Wanted, who asked her to contact detectives in Placer County, California, the county in which Susan's body was found, who took her claim seriously and followed up with an investigation. The detectives linked the two Jane Doe's found in the area in 1984 and 1985 to Terry Nor's detailed stories about her sister's death and concluded that she was telling the truth. Nor's son, William, was arrested on November 4, 1993 in Woodland, California, where he had been living and working. Robert Nord Jr. was charged with his sister's murders while he was still serving a 16-year sentence for the 1991 murder of a Las Vegas bartender. On November 10, 1993, Teresa Nord was arrested at her home in Salt Lake City. At the time of her arrest, Nord was using her maiden name of Cross and was working as a caretaker for her landlord's 86-year-old mother. On November 15, 1993, Nord was charged with two counts of murder, two counts of conspiracy to commit murder, and two special circumstances charges, multiple murder and murder by torture. Nor initially pled not guilty but then made a deal with the prosecution after learning that her son Robert Jr. agreed to testify against her in exchange for a reduced sentence. She pleaded guilty on the condition that she be spared the death penalty. On October 17, 1995, Nor was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. She is incarcerated at California Institution for Women in Chino, California. William Nor was sentenced to probation in order to undergo therapy for participating in his sister Susan's murder. In exchange for his testimony, the prosecution dropped all charges against Robert Jr., save for one count of being an accessory after the fact in relation to Sheila's murder. Robert Nord Jr. pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to three years in prison, which was served concurrently with the 16-year sentence. After moving out of her mother's home, Terry Nord married twice and eventually moved to Sandy, Utah, where she lived with her second husband. She worked as a grocery store cashier in the same neighborhood where her mother also lived and worked before her arrest. Teresa and Terry apparently did not know they lived in close proximity and had no contact. Terry Nord died in 2011, age 41, of heart failure. Teresa Nord's last victim. Welcome to my channel. This is Mr. Scary. Hope you enjoy the show. Thank <laughs> you.